Well, Downsview, good morning. Pastor Pete here on, boy, the 22nd already of December, just a few days before that date on the calendar that we have chosen, a date to mark the coming into the world of the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, who now lives and reigns and is governing this world. Indeed, the government is on his shoulders in the ways that we see him, the ways that we fail to recognize him. The fact is that he is sovereign over all of what we are involved in these days. I want to thank you for your engagement as best as it was on Sunday morning for our worship service. You can still see that worship service at downsviewbaptistchurch.com if you go to the media tab. And I want to especially thank the Sargento family for singing musical worship to the Lord that we can engage in with them. And they will also form the basis for our musical worship on our Christmas Eve service, which is just a couple of days from now on the 24th at 6 p.m. Now that means that just like on Sunday morning, you won't be able to see the video until 6 p.m. And it's going to be a video rather than a live stream because we have not only the Sargento family singers with their musical video that we can splice in there, but also there's about seven or eight of you who've been so gracious to send in those Christmas greeting videos. And so we will have those spliced in amongst the time of devotion around God's Word, the musical talent of others beyond our church family, but also having that opportunity for us to see one another's faces and hear from one another. So, again, downsviewbaptistchurch.com, that's your headquarters for all of these videos. And we will be, <clears throat> as it were, um, premiering that, meaning you can't see it until 6 o'clock but see it at six o'clock on Christmas Eve at this same spot that you're watching this video now. And so friends, one of the interesting things is that in these last, well, couple of months, as I've been doing these daily videos and I've switched them now to these lockdown logs that we're doing, I got an exorbitant amount of encouragement and feedback from last Friday's Friday feature. And that, of course, it was a reading from this Advent reading book that a number of us have been using. Excuse me, that is David Mathis' book, The Christmas We Did Not Expect. And so I do expect God to speak through his people. And all through this pandemic, I have been trying different things, seeing what the Lord might have us do, and in many ways look for them to be affirmed by your response. So I'm going to offer another reading from this Advent reading. It's the one that we had just yesterday, and it's very appropriate for this time of year. And if you've read it, be encouraged and solidified in these truths. And if this is new for you, then please be blessed by it. This is the 21st reading from the 21st day, Loving Hard People at Christmas. And it quotes the scripture from Philippians chapter 2, in particular verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. David Mathis writes, most of our favorite Christmas songs are carols, carols of joy, peace, and love in some form. Yet in reality, the busyness of the season and the inevitable proximity to extended family can make Christmas one of the most relationally challenging times of the year. As we head into the relational trials and opportunities of Christmas Day, I'm reminded myself and reminding myself of three important texts that show how Christmas can produce rather than compromise love for others. Number one, look out to the interest of others. The first Christmas began in the heart of God, or we might say in the mind of Christ. When Paul tells Christians to, quote, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2.5, what follows is a story of the incarnation in some, from heaven to earth. Quote, being in the form of God, Jesus did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Philippians 2, 6 and 7. Now, what mindset gave rise to that first Christmas? Not the impulse to cling to private rights and privileges as God, but the willingness to inconvenience self and sacrifice comfort as a man. Instead of grasping for privilege, Christ emptied himself of his rights. And Paul's corresponding charge to believers is just as appropriate during this season. Verse 4 of Philippians 2 reads, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also to the interest of others. The call of love begins with the call to look, 
a call to look, to look to the interest of others, to get outside of our own needs and preferences, to look beyond ourselves, and to see and to seek to meet the needs and wants of others. How might it transform our Christmas gatherings if we were to generally, quote, look to the interest of others, rather than one bent on recreating the perfect Christmas experiences from the movies or memories? Secondly, having been freed from the prison of self to see the interests of others, what do we do? How do we go about meeting others' needs? Well, Paul's insight into love in 2 Corinthians 12, 15 is powerful, and particularly so at Christmas. He writes, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Paul's fatherly care hadn't always felt loving to the Corinthian Christians. So here he implores them not only to turn their hearts from him, but to see that he really does love them. On what evidence? On the fact that he will most gladly spend and be spent for their souls. Paul's will, Paul will embrace costly, inconvenient personal losses for the sake of their gain. In other words, he will give what is his, his time, energy, attention, possessions, money, comfort, peace of mind, in order to benefit them. And he does not do it begrudgingly or dutifully, but gladly, because in the words of Jesus, it is more blessed to give than receive. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Number three, but it is easier said than done, isn't it? In our sin, we so easily default to selfishness and self-focus rather than looking to the interests of others. How do we keep loving even when it's hard? Well, Hebrews chapter, 2, 33, uh, 30, Hebrews chapter 10, 32 to 34, recalls the time when some in the early church were put in prison for their faith. And others, instead of going into hiding, went public to visit them in prison out of love. In doing so, they exposed themselves to the very same persecution. Their possessions were plundered by official decree or by mob violence. How did they receive that treatment? Hebrews remind them, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Not only did they accept it, but they did so with joy. But how? Where did this come from? To joyfully receive such personal loss, to look to the interests of others, and to gladly spend and be spent? It was because, verse 34 of Hebrews 10, you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Now, the word for property is the same word in the plural as the word possession. So literally, it reads, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your possessions because you knew you had a better and abiding or lasting possession. Because these Christians has had God as their heavenly treasure, they were able to love, or that is, accept the loss of their earthly treasures in the calling of love. And not just accept, but joyfully accept. They joyfully accepted the loss of their finite, earthly, limited, plural possessions because they knew they had an infinite, heavenly, all-satisfying, singular possession whose name is Jesus. If such joy in their great possession could strengthen them to endure all that they suffered and lost, how much more might it inspire genuine love and generosity in us at Christmas? Not just giving our money and material possessions as gifts, but also giving our more treasured possessions, our time, energy, comfort, convenience, and yes, even attention. They knowingly will make the difference this knowing will make the difference when it comes to the call of love. Not just having the great possession, who is God himself, but remembering that we have him. You knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. Abiding one. Such knowing makes possible in us the true joy of Christmas, which is not selfish, but self-sacrificial. It is sacrificial joy. When we enjoy God and his son as our great possession, we are finally free to surrender our small private enjoyments for the greater enjoyment of meeting the needs of others and pointing them to our treasure. The call to look to the interests of others, to gladly spend and be spent, 
and to remember our better and abiding possession is not a call to give up true Christmas joy, but the opposite, to truly taste the depths of delight that God himself came to bring. Hallelujah. Well, I appreciate David Mathis' ministry very much. I want to encourage you to keep looking at this devotional. It doesn't have to be something. In fact, it ought not to be something that we only think about, or at least these truths are only something that we think about leading up to Christmas. But at the bottom of this video, you can see a link where you can download a copy of this. I do have a few copies in my office. If you're around, pop by, and I'm happy to provide them to you. Friends, you know, at, at, at Downsview, we're under this lockdown in Toronto, and we're about to be locked down the entire province for a season. This is what it means for us to look out for the interests of others in our season. In this particular season, it means do what we can to seek the overall safety of other people, not just their physical, but to care for them and think of their interests better than ourselves is the very kind of godly spiritual care that people need. And the witness of the church will be much these days. Thanks for your attention today, friends. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheers.